Hello, this is Hugh Rupersberg. It's June the 9th, 2016, and I'm here in Athens, Georgia with Janice Ray, who is a new inductee into the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame. Uh, Janice was born near Baxley, Georgia. She attended North Georgia College, <coughs> received her BA degree from Florida State University, and her MFA in creative writing from the University of Montana. She's the author of five books of nonfiction, a collection of poems, and numerous articles, and as well as the fact that she has edited several books. Her first book, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, won the American Book Award, the Southern Book Circles Critic Award, and the Southern Environmental Law Center Award for Outstanding Writing on the Southern Environment. It was also chosen for the list of all George, all books that Georgia readers should read, sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book. Her most recent book, Seed Underground, has received many awards too. Janice lives on a small farm near Reedsville, Georgia, with her husband, Raven. And Janice, I'm glad to be talking to you today. Uh, I'd like to ask, to start, a very generic question. I'd like to ask you just to talk about how you uh, became a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my dad is a deeply religious man. Growing up, he wouldn't allow things in the house like television or newspapers. I remember watching him burn a copy of a book he disapproved of. Um, he believed that two kinds of people inherited the earth. He spoke a lot in parable and in biblical terms, and he still does. And those two people were saints and poets. So from a very young age, unable to, you know, isolated by my dad's religion from doing things of the world, I was allowed to go to the library and check out lots and lots of books. So books were um, a portal to the world for me as a young person. Um, I say they saved my life, which is a bit of hyperbole, but they were a gateway to what was possible, what was not possible, what was probable, what was improbable. Um, I also knew as I grew up that, um, that what books had given to me was so vital to the structure and permanence of my life that the best thing I could do would be to return that if possible. So, I mean, that's why I say a lot that I don't care about fame, I don't care about money, what I'm looking for are the stories to tell that are gonna make a difference in how people live their lives, how they find meaning, how they live lives that make sense. Your question was how did I become a writer, yeah. right? So that was it. I was immersed in story very early. First of all, through the Bible, but then through all the books that I read as a child. So what writers, when you started reading as a child, were you mm -hmm. drawn to? Well, so as a child, I was reading things like The Yearling by uh, Mar Marjorie Canan Rawlings and all these uh, Lois Linsky books, Strawberry Girl and so forth. I read a lot of biographies of George Washington Carver and, and I read, you know, all those Little House in the Big Woods, Caddy Woodlawn, Pioneer books. But um, I think the pivotal books were the ones that I began reading in high school. Some teacher in early ninth grade, 10th grade gave me a, a list of classics that if you were going to college and, and me as a, as a isolated, um, not of this world child growing up on a junkyard in South Georgia, I really desired to make something of my life. So I wanted to go to college and I started reading these classics like Les Miserables. But I think the ones that made the most difference for me were the ones that were pounding against my own childhood and my own place. And that would be books like Harry Cruz, 
Childhood, a biography of a place, or, you know, Flannery O'Connor, Eudora Welty. I mean, they were, it, it, they were telling stories in such a way, like I was hearing stories all the time, Hugh. Around me, I was surrounded by stories. You know, why my grandfather plowed so carefully around a, a certain sassafras tree in the field, you know, and what he did when he hit roots, you know, how he brought them to my grandmother and she made tea out of them. So these were the stories. But then to see authors, writers, taking those kind of plain clothes stories and making something extraordinary and surreal and mysterious and deeply meaningful was something I was drawn to from a, a really early age. So I think, I, I do a lot of thinking about being Southern and being a Southern writer. And I really think that there, you know, it's like pieces of flint, you know, my relationship with my place and my relationship with story were just striking constantly against each other. And, and I think you have to be kind of half dead not to have that affect you in a profound way. So you felt drawn to these books, you felt drawn to these writers. Uh, when did you know that you wanted to try to write yourself? When, mm -hmm. At what point did you actually start writing things? Mm -hmm. I probably would have never written anything except in eighth grade I had a teacher named uh, Jerry Carter who had just learned about journaling. Maybe he had gone to a summer teaching workshop. And he came back and he had us do 30 days in a composition book where we wrote every day in it. I still have that. Um, it, it's, you know, it's absolutely terrible writing. It's the writing of a 12, 13 year old, however old I was. But when I handed it back in to him, he graded it. The day he gave them back to us, he asked me to go to the hallway, which um, was a... Not a hopeful sign. <laughs> no. <laughs> the hallway door was looming. And in the hallway, he said, um, he said, I think you have a, a gift. I think you need to keep writing. And really, I think if he hadn't said that to me, you know, and I hear this, Hugh, about other things that all it takes is one person really, I mean, you know, you can live in pretty dismal, hopeless, traumatic circumstances, but if one person sees your light and your brilliance and, I mean, really all you need is just one person who, who can set you on a path. And I'd say he did it. So that means that I had this idea, this seed was planted in my mind, possibly planted early on by my father, I have no idea, but in high school I was actually, you know, like on the literary magazine team on the school newspaper. So I was, I started work at our public library at 14. So early on some librarian saw I was interested in books, had me working in the library in middle school in my extra period and then by high school I was getting paid at one of these you know, one of these fed jobs where they're paying poor kids to come work in community service projects. Like literally, by 14, I was working in a library. So, made a lot of sense. I, in getting stuff together to bring to the archives at UGA, I found a literary magazine from high school and I actually wrote a piece of fiction in there in which I created a scene. And you would think, well, how would this 16 or 17 year old person know to create a scene and I guess it's just that I had read so many scenes that somehow right. I understood what they were. I teach a lot now and that's the thing that I have to focus on the most with beginning writers or student writers is people want to write abstractly. They want to write their thoughts down and that's all wonderful but the, the way that you really compel a reader is by having characters that walk around doing things, saying things. You write, I think it's in your first book, when you were at North Georgia College, uh, hosting the writer James Dickey mm -hmm. and going with a group of students and with him up into the mountains to visit mm -hmm. some place he wanted to go to and that that had a, an impact on you. Mm 
-hmm. Who were other writers when you really had committed yourself to the idea of writing? Uh, who were other writers that either because of what they were writing or what they said to you or, or the examples they set were important? Mm -hmm. So a lot of poets, you're exactly right, and Southern poets, um, so David Bottoms and um, James Dickey. And so let's just start there. So, Southern poets and poets in general and all the old poets, you know, Shelley and uh, Whitman and uh, Shakespeare, all of them. And then beyond that, I think Southern fiction writers, um, not so much Southern nonfiction writers, Although, you know, later I've just loved, I've loved Bartram and Muir's Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf. I really, and Cold Mountain because it's such a, um, oh gosh, it's just in that, it's in that vein. So poets, Southern poets, Southern writers in general. But let me take us into one other direction. So somewhere at North Georgia College, I realized that I loved nature. It wasn't what I was taught as a young person, but somewhere in there, I knew I was an environmentalist before I even knew the term. So I was a young woman when I started reading uh, Thoreau. I read him in high school, actually. And um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Rick Bass, Peter Matheson, Terry Tempest Williams. And that was really the direction that my, if you could call it a career, that's more what I've done with the majority of my life. But the older I get, looking back, the more I return to those early years and, you know, what, the what's bedrock. It, you know, the example of those writers you just listed who sort of that sort of drew you to the nonfiction mm -hmm. approach exactly. to writing. Mm -hmm. That's right. Did poetry come first, by the way? Mm -hmm. And yet you waited till mid-career to publish a collection of poems. I did, and I have more collections that I haven't published. And I don't know why. In fact, I just was, yeah, just well, going through my stuff, I saw that. I think the impulse it, to be a poet comes out in your prose. Yeah, so. thank you for saying that, the lyricism. But also, this is the fickle part of my nature, but I am altered by the response I get from things. And I look at people who spend their entire lives writing poetry, like W.S. Merwin, for example, um, or Patty Ann Rogers, and I admire them, but I just think you doom yourself to a kind of obscurity. You know, if you can't enter story, which is, which is what, I mean, we're all looking for the stories that are going to show us how to live. And we, we look to fiction and nonfiction for that, and we don't so much look for poet to poetry for it. So that got a little scary to me, you know? Yeah. I guess I have a, a series of questions sort of focused on your, your relationship to Georgia and to the idea of place. And, and the first one actually has to do with the American West where you spent some of your life. You went to graduate school mm -hmm. in Montana. And it's interesting to me that uh, that experience in terms of writing about nature uh, so far in your work hasn't played a major role. That All of your work is focused on Georgia or northern mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. Are you going to come to Montana t at some point? Are you going to mm -hmm. deal with it? or What drew you first to Georgia, other than the fact you've lived much of your life here? I just think it wasn't really being done. Uh, you know, the, the, the Western nature writing movement was far advanced by the time we kind of cobbled together a Southern nature writing movement. Now, we do have, you know, Bartram and Muir and the people and others, the people I've mentioned, but 
really this sort of movement that we've had in the 80s, 90s, and thousands um, happened later in the South than it did, where you, you know, you were, you had Edward Abbey who was writing about why you needed to save the desert and, and Stegner doing the same thing and on and on. Um, we have to mention Wendell Berry here, always a hero of mine and somebody who actually was a, I consider him a prophet, but a leader in this, this whole place right here. So why Georgia? I don't know. I just felt like nobody was telling these stories. There were, there were stories that had to be told. We were destroying so many beautiful things about this amazing place that uh, somebody had to say something about it. And that's why I did it. Will I write about Montana? I probably will never write about Montana. I sometimes wish I'd been born in Montana, so that was my nativity, and I could tell those stories freely, but they're not mine. So in reading your books, I find a double narrative, and I don't think this is going to be a surprise to you or to others who've read your books. There is the, the narrative of your own life, mm -hmm. whether it's how you came to be the person you are now or or things that you're currently engaged in doing, combined with the narrative of the environment in mm -hmm. which you live. And whether it's where you grew up or the Altamaha River or, or the Pinhook Swamp. And mm -hmm. So uh, would you comment mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think there's, uh, it's sort of like parallel arcs and one is personal history and one is natural history. And I really, honestly, I know I'm a memoirist, but I use, na I use personal history as a kind of vehicle to tell the other. Because without it, then all I'm doing is writing nonfiction, and my audience is even more limited. Do you see? So I thought, when I was writing about longleaf pine, I thought, nobody's ever going to read a book about a pine tree that's 99% gone. Who cares? But I, but story carries everything. And if you can get somebody to fall in love with a character in the beginning, they're going to read to the bitter end to find out what happens. And so I really used my life as that. I knew I had an interesting life. I got this fascinating, freaky family, you know, a dad that ran a junkyard all his life, you know, my grand, you know, Plenty of people in my family who have struggled with mental illness and still do, and all that's woven in, the poverty. I mean, it's a very colorful story, and I just thought, gosh, I could use this to tell what I considered to be a bigger story, a vital story. And so then it becomes not my story, Hugh, and that's when I look at letters that I get from people, that's what people say is, that's my childhood. Or, oh my gosh, you woke me up to my place, so now I'm walking in, out in the Piedmont of South Carolina getting to, you know, that is, that is, yes. So the answer is yes. There are two words in the book, uh, the title of your first book, that really draw attention to themselves. And one is the word cracker, mm -hmm. which is, one could say, is a controversial word, a fraught word. And you really seem to take ownership of it. It's not a negative. You know, we frequently hear it used as a negative. Would you talk about that word? Well, there's always a price to pay, I will say that, for, um, for stepping into marginality or for stepping outside safety. I'll say that. So the use of that word, though, very well studied and very well planned comes at a great cost. Um, and part of it is the, the terrible racial connotations and class connotations that are wrapped up with it. So when, when the book first came out, I knew that I would never go to a reading without somebody, and usually the first question, asking, what do you mean by the word cracker? Um, 
you know that there has been this marvelous thing that's been happening where as poorer people have been able to get an education, they've been able to write books about their lives. So, in, you know, a hundred years ago, it was people of privilege who were able to have the time and the resources to be Southern writers or writers at all. And so then you started getting these books coming from the lower class, the working class, poor. And that would be like The Liars Club by Mary Carr or Rick Bragg's All Over But, but The Shouting. And mine falls into that. Um, I wanted the book to be uh, the ecology of poor, a poor white trash's childhood. You see? So I was using that term like you would use hillbilly. Just like, oh my gosh, now the poor people get their turn to tell the story. Um, I w I'd, I'd like just to speak one more minute, Hugh, about race. And that is, so as a child, I went to an all-black church. My, maybe my dad, I was probably six years old when my dad heard this black preacher from Philadelphia on the radio. He got on the train and went there. But then when he came back, he found the closest church to where we were, which was in Brunswick. So on Sundays, we would drive the 70 miles to Brunswick and go to church and drive back. And it's this very strict uh, interpretation of the Bible and no pants and women wear hats and don't cut their hair and don't wear jewelry and don't wear makeup. Um, where was I going with that? I believe that I believe that racism, like any time that we say, well, I was sitting there talking to a black man, that that is racism because I, we, I believe we should just say, I'm sitting there talking to a man. And I believe that the way to end racism is for us to develop our own deep, intimate relationships with people of all colors. And you know how hard it is to be, to develop deep relationships with people who are different from you in any way. It's most safe to be around people who are like yourself. Um, it, I don't like having to explain why I used Cracker, but I do think that it was an attempt to bring up this issue of race. Minor anecdote, but yesterday, we, my husband and I did a little two-hour farm. We live on an organic farm, so we did this little two-hour farm lessons with some a summer camp and um uh oh let me think where my train of thought thought was going what were we talking about use of the word <laughs> cracker <laughs> summer camp oh it's my gosh it's a senior farm it just went out of my head it'll come back I, I saw in part i saw the use of the word cracker as a way of calling attention to the experience of poor whites who grew up in rural southern Georgia that no one really even is aware of till your attention is called to them. And although it's a, a term that some see as negative, it's also a term that legitimately characterizes a whole class category of people. Yeah. I remember that, so I, I was introducing what we do to the kids, and I said, call me Janice, and this is my husband, call him Raven. I knew that every adult there would want me to be called Miss Janice, but there was this piece of myself that wanted to rub up against all these mores that we keep in place in the South, you know, including white entitlement, and I said to the kids, don't call me Miss Janice, you know. So that is just really kind of a part of my nature that even though it's difficult sometimes to, to, to stay strong when the flack is coming back at you for do, doing something, but always to chafe at the boundaries and the limits. The other word in the title of that book that I find very interesting is, of course, the word ecology. Mm -hmm. And you use that word not only in the first book, but the others, I think, also not simply to designate something having to do with the natural environment, but with culture. And home. And with family and with mm -hmm. home. So. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in the title of the second book, but it wasn't in the title originally. I actually didn't title that book. Somebody, the publisher did. And the title was something else at, in the beginning. I can't even remember it. But then I, I think just to, to write on, you know, to continue the thread of the first one, it was added to the subtitle of the second book. But yeah, so ecology, this, the study of our place, the study of home, um, it's, yeah, it's, all I know to say is it's, it's something I'm totally passionate about. Um, I don't really know anything else to say about that. In your, in all of your books, I think you, you're testifying to your sense of the importance of place. We live in a world where people move all over the place all the time. Yeah, I move see where you're going. Move from one region to another region, move yeah. between countries, and you could almost begin to wonder whether the concept of place, as we've traditionally used it, especially here in the South, is, is losing its original meaning, or even losing anything unique. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, so there you have it, yes. And, and that is, that's the sensibility that I work from right there, that, that place matters. And why it matters is because our psyches are attached to it, you know. We are our memories. Our memories are attached to place. It, it takes some time to tease all that out. But, I, you, know, you know, the Stegner quote, uh, which is, tell me, uh, tell me where you're from and I'll tell you who you are, you know. I... I think that's exactly right, and I think that's what we're in danger of losing. I blame it on our, I hate to get into this, but I blame it on our economic system in this country, that, it, that industrial capitalism asks of its people to be willing to leave the things that they love that matter all the way down to their bones, which are made of place and go someplace else to study, to get a job, to have a career, to uh, do an internship. And so we're constantly leaving these deep connections to landscapes, to, um, to histories, to family, to clans, to cultures that we know and feel comfortable, comfortable in. So yes, however, there is some, you know, I understand the benefits of globalism and I understand how stifling a place can, can be if you're different, you know? I mean, be gay in small town, rural South Georgia, you know? Be transgender in South Georgia. Be anything that's different and not fundamentalist in South Georgia and the story is gonna look very different. So just for the record, and this will not be struck, but I spend a lot of time pretending that I am something that I am not, so that I can get by in my immediate surroundings, uh, trying to bring the culture of, um, of my place back to something like it has been. Uh, that sounds crazy to, st to say because we've had, you know, We've had slavery and uh, oppression of women and destruction of natural resources, but mixed in all that, there was a, a love of place that is uniquely Southern that definitely we're losing in the homogeneity of industrial capital, capitalism. Um, why keep it? Like, why does it matter? Well, it matters because if you don't love a place, then you're totally willing to destroy it. If you don't know the names of the trees and the names of parts of the terrain, you don't care. If you don't have decades and generations of stories that are tied to that bend in the river or that old road or that cemetery, who cares if the whole cemetery gets bulldozed down? That's why I use it. Because what I see in globalization is another word for destruction. And I see, I see in place 
being able somehow to create inclusive communities that, that are made up of the things that matter. I mean, we're becoming pretty isolated, marginal individuals. And so, so we know from ecology that a, a wild area you know, is home to species. The larger the wild area, the greater the diversity of species. You know, habitat is killing species. But we also know then, so community is vital to wild species plants and animals. But we also know that community is vital to humans. And we're living in a time where we see more and more marginalized individuals getting divorces, not knowing their next door neighbors, going in and shooting up schools, doing all kinds of crazy things. And I think it's because we're losing these networks of safety that we had. We're willing to demonize entire people, you know, Immigrants who do our hard labor, black people, all kinds of people. Women, my current obsession uh, because of, uh, well, I won't say why, but my current obsession is, is, um, is child abuse. Didn't happen to me. But I am, I am in, uh, I'm being fate forced to grapple with how prevalent it is in this world and how many children are being abused. And that is a sheer product of the breakdown of circles of human community. Um, let me ask you, to talk about, and I think this is a, a subject that really is of interest <coughs> in your first two books especially and in, in, in your later books as well, but you have a rich and complex and interesting family and attitude towards your family. And I think that's a big part of why Ecology of a Cracker Childhood is so so good and uh, it resonates I think with a lot of people. I myself have a large family from a different background than yours and um, were you mindful of your family's reactions as you were writing this book? Did you ask them for their opinions? Did you protect them? Or how did you sort of negotiate that issue as you were working on mm -hmm. that first That's book? That's a great question. My father and mother got to read the last draft of the book, and um, I asked them if, to tell me if there was anything with which they were uncomfortable and that I would change it. Um, my dad had a, a very strong reaction to the book, and it precipitated a really big argument. I've told this many times in public, so I think it can go online. Um, um, he told me to leave, not come back, you know, called me names in his woundedness. And I did something really amazing, which was I just stood up and said, you're my father and I'm not, and I love you and I'm not going anywhere. You're my father. Well, he did, he stormed out the back door and I, I was living at my grandmother's house and I was at the junkyard at the time this happened. So I did go back home, but by dawn the next morning, I was calling back to my uh, mother and father's house, trying to work it through. Um, in the end, I made the changes my dad wanted. We agreed that if the editor changed anything, that had to stand, and he became my great, the greatest proponent of the book. My dad went around my little town and other little towns with the Milkweed Editions catalog before the book came out. And he pre-sold 250 copies of the book of hardback in our little town. Now there were, there were I think three print runs adding up to 10,000 during the first year of that book coming out. My dad continued to sell books and he sold 1,000 hardback books. 
My dad sold one-tenth of the initial print runs, the hardback of the book. Then it went to paperback and he continued to sell. He got a greater discount. You know how booksellers who sell a lot of a certain book will go on up and they'll get a 50% discount on the book. My dad was getting like a 55% discount on books where as the author, I was getting a 40% discount. <laughs> That's how he, he, he would come with me to readings. He would set up the table. You know, my dad, he, he had t-shirts made that had my name, my picture, environmentalist, writer, author, environmentalist, you know, on the t-shirt. He just became a fierce advocate. He's already a great salesman, but I think he saw what I was trying to do. I knew I don't want to cause more wounds with my work. I'm very careful about that. I think, I really think things through over and over and over again. Now, a lot of the stories in ecology, I could never have created out of my head. I had to call up my brothers and sisters, my aunts and uncles and have long, long conversations. How do you remember this? How do you remember this? So Hugh, when I was young, I used to think the truth was black and white. You robbed the store or you didn't rob the store. And the older I get, so that book came out, let's see, it came out in 99, right? I was born in 62, so I was 30, is that 37? Um, by 37, I realized that truth comes in shades of gray, you know? My father and mother had to sign a paper from the, from the attorneys uh, at the, pu the publisher's attorneys, and it, was, it basically said that we won't sue for whatever's in here. My dad, he, he had me handwrite at the bottom of the, the paper, this line, this is not my truth. This is my daughter's truth, but I honor her telling it. I mean, really, what else could you ask of a parent than that? This is my child's truth. It's not mine. That's a great story. Yeah, he's a great man. Well, all the members of your family, your parents and your grandparents, I think were very interesting characters, people as you present them. So let me just say this, your family would be too and anybody else's family. It's just, so you have to train yourself to look for the details and you know mm -hmm. this as a professor uh, and, and as a person who studied literature. But you train yourself to look for the traits in a person that tell the most about that person. So I probably could, my, I don't know, the, I probably could portray members of my family in a way that would be fairly boring. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I've made yeah. up nothing about them. But to some people, they might be pretty, just pretty plain folks. But when you get in there and you start questioning and you realize like, Oh my gosh, my father actually believes in, in being psychic. You know, and look, I was just thinking about this and my father just stated it like, and, and I, so yeah, I do get to this other place with my family, especially with my dad, where there's definitely something going on there that's beyond what's visible. And that was, that too was a wonderful gift to get from a parent. There's something going on that's beyond what you can see with my dad. My son was born under the call, uh, they call it under the call, or, and you tell me about time. I don't know how we're doing here, but uh, if, a, if a woman's water doesn't break, the, the child, the baby is born in the sack, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's, it's a sign, like an, it's an old wives sign of they have special powers. My son also has that, you know, like, he can, it, it's, it's really crazy, but he can come in and really get a feel for a person almost instantly, whether they're safe, not safe, whether they're telling the truth, whether their, their ego is bigger than their, uh, you know, body. My son also has that skill. So you have in your books a great uh, ability to give portraits, whether they're short or more developed, of people. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that, and that follows from what you've just been saying. These people that you meet at a trailer park in the middle of nowhere, where you, you're getting ready to go into a swamp, uh, members of your family, just people from the local 
area that you really do draw out very interesting characteristics of these people. Have you ever considered trying your hand at fiction? Mm -hmm. I have. I have a, a first novel written and uh, one chapter of that published in the Georgia Review as a short story. Um, I simply have not had time to revise it. It's sitting on my desk now. I'm actually working on another novel right now, which is based on a true story, but it's a story about some children in the 40s who were, um, they were in Fannin County taken up, uh, they were taken up to a cabin in a holler without a parent, and it appears that they were taken there to not survive. And it's a it's a fascinating story. They they were they were saved after I think they were there for eighteen months to two years. Um, I've been interviewing them. It's just a fascinating story, but it would have to be fiction. So I'm working on that. Um, I love fiction, but I'm I just it. I'm going to say this, and I, and this was with an apology to everybody who writes literary nonfiction, but literary nonfiction is pretty easy to write because you've got your stuff right there. It's just a matter of you drawing out from it what's going to make it fly. And fiction is a little bit more difficult, I believe. I've been reading Robert Olin Butler talking about fiction and he talks about having to get in this zone, you know, where it's coming to you and you can't let ideas drive it and it's not coming out of your intellect. So I've been skating, Hugh, using my intellect to write. Because I'm writing literary nonfiction. When you talk about, uh, you talked about these two, you know, personal history, narrative, natural history, so these two layer, I think of it in terms of many layers. So I have like, the main narrative, I have these sub-narratives. And I look at, I look at it like uh, the forest floor. Like there's just many, many layers to work. And I'm off on a tangent. Well, I think uh, it takes the same skill to to write uh, an accomplished work of nonfiction as it would to take a it was as it would take to write a novel. You might, do? Yeah, I do. I think in some ways it might be more difficult because you hold yourself to facts, although you might have to mm -hmm. present them in certain ways. Um, but you're a, more of an expert on this than I am. I would want to ask you some questions related to the natural world. Okay, I'll try to answer them. I'm no biologist. Do we live in a country that's so dedicated to what you refer to as industrial capitalism mm -hmm. that we've reached a point where the country itself is somehow incompatible with the concept of wildness, of wilderness of natural environment. I don't know, but it's a little sad to contemplate that, do you think? I will say this, I mean, I've been hearing a lot of news stories lately about there not being enough trails at Yellowstone. And that's because, you know, millennial, although we've now, so globally, over 50% of us live in cities. And in this country, it's over 80%, you know? So we are an urban people. However, we still want to get out in wildness for that, those little periods of respite and retreat and whatever reasons we go to wildness. So, you know, here we are, we're needing bigger and more trails in Yellowstone, and yet over two-thirds of us live in urban areas. It's a crazy paradox, is it not? It's a crazy paradox. So I actually look at, at how, where we choose to live uh, and how we live as a, this kind of more continuum. So wilderness to me um, is on one end and you move through agrarianism. So, so that would be, so this was, is represented by like a hunter gatherer, you know, the paleo life. And uh, the agrarianism represented by a field on through industrialism represented by factory, through technologism, which is where we are now, represented by, you know, computers or whatever. And so on that 
continuum, I personally would like all movement to be back this way toward wilderness, but I'm actually happiest somewhere right there in agrarianism. So uh, this brings me to this other part of, of the answer, which is how do we live in community in these places? You know, like we've got to We've got to deal with the lonely ruralist and with the lonely hunter-gatherer, you know, at some point. We are gravitating toward cities for a reason. And that's because we like each other. We learn in relationship to other people. And we're driven by things, by material possessions. So, so the question becomes, do we live, the question is, let's go back to it, do we live in a world where we can't reach that anymore? Maybe. There are fewer and fewer of us that can. There are fewer and fewer of us that can sit in even a country place, even a farm, and feel fulfilled and inspired. Like, I, that's something when, when we first moved to the farm, Reedsville. We, we live 10 miles west of Reedsville in the delta of the Ohupi and the Altamaha rivers. It's a very wild place. We don't have any neighbors within eyesight of our farm. Farm's 46 acres. On our road, which is about two miles long, it's a dirt road, uh, there are two houses, neither of which are visible. They're down. N not visible from our place. Um, every day, like day after day after day goes by when I don't see a soul except my family. That's something not many people can do actually because we have learned to know ourselves through what is mirrored back to us from other people including strangers on the street. So we've learned to actually define our lives by a kind of anonymity. It's a strange paradox because it's an anonymity that takes place while surrounded by hundreds of people. Somebody needs to write about it because I don't understand it. And I, so what I've done, and I know I'm really off the subject, is um, I know that there are other things that take the place of community where I am. Sparse neighbors, my relationships with our animals. We have lots of animals on the farm. Beauty. I mean, an unworldly beauty. So wilderness, um, I fought for it. I fought for it all my life. I continue to fight for it. I think it's a great thing. And I think we're relegating it to uh, smaller and smaller patches. And we're visiting those patches less and less often. We have wilderness in Georgia, in the Chattooga, in the Okefenokee. Um, the, the delta of the Altima Hall is sheer wilderness. The barrier islands are wilderness. We have, we have a lot of it, and most of us are afraid of it. Most of us won't go there. If we can just, Hugh, just keep it as repositories for life itself and the processes of life, maybe that's all we need to do. Maybe, maybe we can live in cities, but we've got to figure out how we're going to live sustainably in a city because a city is not a self-contained unit. It is only sustained by the countryside around it that's feeding it food and water and clean air and taking away its waste. So in one of your books somewhere, you probably more than once mentioned the poet John Keats. And in thinking about your books and, and what they seem to be doing, mm -hmm. I was thinking about his statement at the end of Ode on a Grecian Urn. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know is beauty in the form of a work of art which is in the form of a, a book uh, of non creative nonfiction, its own justification, or must it have a purpose outside itself? 
Did I make that a clear mm -hmm. question? Yeah. Does art... So, okay, well, you just restate it once. Does art need to have a purpose other than to be art? I think the purpose of art is to have meaning and to find meaning. And that's why I will tell you there are some art forms that make me uncomfortable. You know, I'm not a language poet. I'm just not. I'm not. <laughs> In the High Museum of Art, you'll see these large paintings. It's, you know, like large red painting with one white line down it. I look and I look and I try to find meaning there. But if I don't find meaning, it to me it's just, it's, it's, pandering its self something. I want to say lo self-loathing, but that's not true. So, so the question, but there is a place you're getting to that I'm not answering, and well, that has something to do with Does art need to have a social purpose? And when I read your books, I see a social purpose that is in addition to telling your own story and, and things about your, your personal life and history. You're talking about the natural world, the disappearance of wilderness, the need to save it and preserve it. And that, to me, is a social purpose. Yeah. Do we live in an age where we can afford to have books that in some way or the other don't have that social purpose? I hate to be caught on record saying, saying no. I, I am a woman with a mission, and I have zero tolerance for anything that is not trying to make a better world. I see so much suffering, and it affects me just to my bones, and I, I want to end suffering. I don't really know the part beauty plays in all that. I don't know. Well, there's the beauty of art, but there's also the beauty of, you know, the natural world, which you're writing about mm -hmm. and evoking. But, um, so here's a question sort of related to the issue of being a writer and being a writer who cares about the natural environment. Do you have an opinion on e-books? <laughs> You're funny. Do I have an opinion? I have pretty much an opinion on everything, Hugh. Um, e-books, I, I, I can barely read a book online. People, I get asked to blurb so many writers' books, and they want to send me a digital version of the book, you know, like, read this and send us back a blurb, and we need it in three weeks. and. I can't do it. It's like a book is an artifact to me. However, you know, there's this other thing where I think that a lot of books aren't being vetted very well this, these days. You know, I get, a, I, get, I get asked to read a lot of books where I, I don't think they're being edited and, ri and written well to start with and then edited well enough. And so I, I don't know. I think, I just think, gosh, does this deserve to use the, the Earth's resources to publish this? Um, we think, a lot of us think with e-books and with computers that at least we're saving trees, but the destruction connected to computers is vastly, wildly uh, it, superior to the destruction caused by paper and cutting down trees. Now, it's huge with trees, it's huge but it is a wild destruction that creator, that computers, their parts, the plastic, the oil wells, the servers that are creating all this heat, the air conditioning, the mountains being blown off. I mean, I really think the coal, I think, I think mountaintop removal and our race for coal the past 20 years has been driven for the most part by computers. That's, that's, a, that's a, 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 an exaggeration, but in my heart of hearts, I believe it. So what kind of advice do you have for students who want to be writers or for young people who are committed to trying to be writers? 
People have to read. It's what everybody says, but you really have to read. And I can tell a person who reads from a person who doesn't read. Um, a lot of people just want to be a writer, you know, because it's it, it, there's there's a good deal of entitlement going on in current society. Entitlement and um, like the whole I generation stuff. And so it's like, well, let me write a book. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think writing is a it's a profession that takes a lot of study and a lot of struggle and take it seriously because you're the person who's creating civilization, you know? So that's my first piece of advice is to read a lot. Read the old guys. Read the guys who were writing before we had cars, you know? Read how to write without fossil, without vehicles and being all over your writing. You know, and this is actually more important than I'm making it sound. I, I think people, I think we sh really should look at our references to, to cars and other fossil fuel technologies in our work. Because when we focus on that or when it just plays such a major part, I think we're not focusing on relationship, which I believe is the center for the true nature of literature, which is to uh, show, to show something that has meaning, to show something that's going to, to shine light, the epiphany, to shine light. And I think the things that are happening when we're all trapped in cars, traveling here, traveling there, and I, I just think it's very difficult to shine light on what needs to be shined when we're lost, trapped in our cars and in our trains and in our planes, moving very fast. Let me just think one more minute, um, Hugh, about what other advice. Um, that's good enough. They've just got to read and study. Before we're done, do you have any questions that you want to ask yourself? Mm -hmm. You are a very sneaky one. Questions to ask myself. I don't think so. Oh, well, I've really enjoyed speaking with you and it's been Thank a great you. experience and I uh, hope that you have a great day. Thank you. I am most uncomfortable when I'm being questioned. As a writer, I love to question others, you know. I love being the one asking the questions. So thank you so much for asking great questions and thank you for having me today. Thank you.